Hi there, this is Jim Salestrom. I'm here for the Colorado Business Roundtable and the ICOSA Network. And I am here as a traveling troubadour in Keystone, Colorado today with an incredible um, sportsman and an incredible uh, story. Uh, this gentleman that I'm with today, is, his name is Alexander Rossi. And Alexander Rossi, as most of you listening know, won the Indianapolis 500 last year, 2016. Congratulations, Alex. That's amazing. Thank you very much for being here today. Um, I've read your bio and I met you a number of years ago, mm -hmm. but let's just dive in. You know, can you tell us uh, where you're from and uh, how you got into racing cars? Yeah, I mean, first of all, thank you for, for having me. Um, I am from Northern California, a small town uh, near Lake Tahoe, actually, and, and not the drivers would, would usually come from. But um, it was a it was a passion of mine that I shared with my father growing up, and him and I would go to, to races at Laguna Seca in, in Monterey, California. And it was a father-son kind of experience that we did for, for quite a few years. And then for my 10th birthday, he took me to, to Las Vegas um, for a three-day go-kart school. And it was supposed to be kind of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and um, quite a special experience. And, and at the end of those three days, I fell in love with driving and, and racing. And Did you take right to it? I mean, was it like something that you, you knew in your heart that you really were good at? And... As much as a 10-year-old can. Yeah, I think so. Um, and then we, we kind of took a baby step into to racing. We did an arrive-and-drive go-kart championship, which means you don't provide any of the carts you kind of just show up and you get in the equipment and you race and then you go home type thing and that was a good way to kind of get our feet wet and see if if, if i really enjoyed it and i did and then was this like high school ish no I, I was 11 you were 11 and then from there we we went and purchased go-karts and i was at a go-kart track 45 weekends a year for three years is that right yeah and a lot of people might not know it but these go-karts are they're they're uh, very fast. Oh well, yeah, quick. I mean, I was a, I was a eleven to thirteen year old driving seventy mile an hour go kart. So, right. Um, it was it was definitely it's what you know taught me the fundamentals and it, most racing drivers um, start in go karts. And then for me, the the big difference was I moved into race cars when I was fourteen, which was was pretty early. Did someone mentor you, or did you did you? Uh... You went to a track and, and, uh, and jumped right into the deep end. Yeah, I mean, I was part of uh, the Skip Barber Racing School, oh, yeah. um, which, which is kind of not as, as strong as it used to be. I mean, a lot of racing has, has changed um, in the past you know, decade with, with economic issues. Um, so no, I was a part of a racing championship, school championship, and it was, that was kind of what taught me, I guess, the basis of driving a race car. Um, and then from there, I, I, I moved to Europe when I was 17, and, and I'd been in Europe and racing in Formula One for the past kind of seven years and, and came back to the U.S. and IndyCar um, at the beginning of 2016. And the difference between Formula One and, and IndyCar is, is, is it's quite profound, isn't it? Or is it? Yes and no. I mean, it's, it's profound to people involved in the sport. Um, and, and the easiest way to explain it is it comes down to money. So a Formula One team will spend four hundred million dollars a year on two cars. Is that right? Whereas an IndyCar team will spend thirty million dollars a year on two cars. So it's 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 a tenth of the cost, and with that, you know, there's there's a lesser amount of performance. Um, but the main kind of concept um, between Formula One and Indy cars is the same. They're both single seater open wheel cars. Um, they both are incredibly quick in terms of cornering capabilities, braking capabilities. If anything, Indy cars are, are faster in a straight line, um, but we struggle compared to a Formula One car with with braking and acceleration because right? of our weight. Uh, we have a pretty big weight disadvantage. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there's there's differences, but at the end of the day, in terms of overall lap time, they're they're fairly close. Um, it's just Formula One is more on the cutting edge of technology than than Indy cars. Well, I would tell our listening audience um, that we're talking to Alexander Rossi, and uh, he is the. Uh, he is the person that won the Indianapolis 500 last year, 2016, and uh, you're you're a very young man to uh, to have done that, I would think. And also, um, I always thought race car drivers were like little little tiny wiry guys, and yeah. you're very fit, and uh, he's a very good looking guy, but <laughs> but he's uh, very you know you're very fit, you're very thin, but you're tall. Yeah, yeah. No, are, I'm, you I'm si six, are you six one? I'm six two, um, which you're right. He's tall for for a racing driver. Um, for it's not really an issue. Now, um, but when I was in Europe, it, weight was a big kind of requirement and a, and a, and a regulation. Um, so being six two and trying to hit a weight requirement of one hundred and fifty pounds is pretty difficult. So wow. I looked a lot different twelve months ago than I do is now. Is that right? Yeah. Do you? Um, 
So they weigh the drivers before they... They do an IndyCar as well. It's just a different minimum weight requirement. I see. How much weight would a driver lose in an, in the Indianapolis 500? I mean, is, are you just constantly uh, it depends on burning the, calories? It depends on the race you're at. So, I mean, it depends on the climate you're in. Um, you'll lose anywhere from four to six pounds. Wow. I want to do that. I'd like to learn how to do that, Alex. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's just water weight. So, <laughs> you just so drink you, water. You, you got to put it back in, or else or, you'll, you'll have pretty big issues. Or a great big quart of milk, right? It's, it's, <laughs> That's also that was a thing. Yeah. What's the tradition with the milk? Do it, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, it was it was something that was um, requested in the very beginning, and the winner wanted a glass of buttermilk. That sounds like the most disgusting thing I can ever imagine after you're <laughs> right. in a race car for two to three hours. And, right. um, you know, you're dripping with sweat and you want buttermilk, but it stuck and it became kind of the signature thing of the Indianapolis 500. So it's, it's, it's an interesting tradition. It's one that's a little bit strange, but at the end of the day, when you're in that, you, you're doing that because you won the race. So you don't really care. Um, but I will tell you, after you pour it on yourself and you're in your soup four hours later, it's it's not it's, the, it's, it's not it's, the greatest smell. In the world. <laughs> is, that, is that right? <laughs> yeah. We've seen it as a tourist or never seen it. Never, never, never obviously competed in it. So every there's a, there's a huge two week lead up to the actual race itself, um, and I mean it consists of the third largest parade on the planet, behind the Macy's Day Parade and the Rose Bowl Parade. So no I mean, it's, it's a really big deal in, in Indianapolis. Um, so. Each day there was there was something going on, and, and each day there was a tradition that I was kind of learning about. So I think that part of it was the most eye-opening. The actual driving on the track, as big of a race as it was, I mean, we had 400,000 people in attendance. I mean, the largest single-day sporting event in the history of, of any sport. Um, so it was, despite the magnitude of that, you know, you just you showed up Sunday morning, you went through your process with your team and your engineers, and you just tried to treat it like a race. Um, despite the magnitude of it. So it wasn't really, it wasn't really until say a couple months afterwards where the realization of kind of what you had accomplished set, set in. Um, and then now going back to the speedway, I have a very different understanding and appreciation of it, obviously. Do you automatically get to go back because you're the champion? I mean, are you inv- you're invited? Oh, no. I mean, so it's, it, the Indy 500 is a race of a 17 race calendar of the Rise of the IndyCar series. I see. So it's, yeah, I mean, we'll be back next May. Um, right. It's our fourth race of the season. So, yeah. Did you have to put your syndicate together, your your team, your... your uh... No, so I drive for Andretti Autosport and Honda. Um, Mar- so, Mario Andretti? So Michael Andretti. Oh, son, Michael Andretti. His son yeah. owns it. Um, I, his teammate, or my teammate, is actually Marco Andretti, so Michael's son and Mario's grandson. Um, and yeah, we have a four-car operation, and, and we compete in the championship, like I said, from... You know, the first race that we have in, in March in St. Petersburg, Florida, through the finale in Sonoma, California, um, and one of the races is the 500. So. Is it a grind? Is it really, is it is it tough yeah. physically and I mean, I mentally? Drive, and... I could drive race cars for a living, so it's, it's, it, I can't complain too much. But yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a lot of training that goes into it. Um, I saw an interview with Paul Newman one time, and it, they asked him a question about, you know, racing cars, and he, I think he did it kind of as a hobby, but he was, he was you know, fairly, you know, uh, successful at it. But he said, you know, something about it's not. There's a lot more to it than just pressing. Yeah, there's a lot the more pedal to, it to the than, metal than you, know? you think. I mean, uh, and the reason that I guess people don't understand that is because their their kind of understanding of, of a car is driving a road car. But I mean, a race car which has unlimited more potential and grip and capability um, with no power assistance in terms of steering or braking or any sort of stability traction control um there's no assistance there's no driver aid so everything is kind of by what you feel through your butt and, osmosis and, and, and what yeah, how you exactly could, yeah and then so like you have to be in tune with what you hear and what you see and, and uh, oh, it's, it's everything it's, it's, it's all it's all feeling i mean you use all of your sensations but i mean the cars are so sensitive that we can we can lower for example the front ride height by one millimeter and it'll make a big performance is difference. that right wow very very small tolerances that we're dealing with wow do you have to carry spare engines for these cars? You know, oh, like, yeah. So, I mean, when, when my truck rolls to a race, it'll have my, my main car and then a backup car, and there'll be at least probably four or five engines. So. Talking to Alexander Rossi for the Colorado Business Roundtable, this is Jim Sales from saying thank you very much, Alex, and I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. And it's very nice to meet you again, and uh, great. We're going to be pulling for you this coming Labor Day. Yes, absolutely. We'll be pulling for you. All right. Congratulations.